entering in about two minutes, I'll just uh, introduce him, not to me, not an introduction. Um, if, um, if the only thing that uh, Brian May had, had, uh, had achieved was being a guitarist in a rock group, it would still be quite an achievement to have been the uh, rock guitarist in Queen, one of the most successful bands ever. Uh, but of course, he's also uh, started a PhD decades ago. Um, it took him 30 years to complete it because it's, it's kind of a bit busy. So being <laughs> um, and so he's actually Dr. Brian May. Um, however, the most important thing that he's achieved, as far as we're concerned, is setting up the group Save Me, campaigning particularly against hunting, but also we're concentrating on badges, working with many other groups to try and achieve as much as possible. Um, He's, uh, he's with us today. I think a lot of people want to take photographs. Um, perhaps do that at the start and the end rather than have constant interruption to photographs, please. Um, so uh, we have to get the lead off right now. sold out as this is amazing. I love sold out concerts. Uh, <laughs> something about it when you're turning people away. There's nothing quite like it. Um, I'll make a little excuse first. If, if I'm a little less coherent than I might have been, it's because uh, my son was in a, um, in a bad traffic accident last night and he's in hospital at the moment. Eh? And uh, he's going to be okay. <laughs> but uh, it's, it was a close thing. So I'm sort of feeling a bit, um, bit jarred. But also very thankful that he's alive. Um, <clears throat> Okay, I'm speaking to you on the subject of man as a wild animal. Um, there is kind of a problem, I think, in me speaking about this to you guys. Because really I'm preaching to the converted. I know full well that all of you who have given up your weekend, Sunday and Christmas, to attend something like this actually do care about your fellow man and care about animals. So forgive me, I'm not trying to preach to you. I, the reason I'm here, I think, is to sort of crystallize some ideas that we all have. And uh, you know, perhaps it can um, help inspire some of you to to, uh, to light some bonfires out there and actually go out and, and spread the word because we really need to do that. I think at this point, it's a rather grim time for the UK. I think. Um, so I know that you're all decent people, and and you don't need me to tell you how to be behave. So please bear that in mind. I, I don't wish to come across as um, telling you what to do. In fact, it would probably be more useful for me to do this speech to, um, to other people. Like, maybe I should go to Eton College, or maybe I should, maybe I should go to DEFRA headquarters. <laughs> maybe I should go and see Mr. Cameron. All these pro-hunting, pro-cruelty mates, including Mr. Clay, it seems, who seems to have become a conservative. <laughs> Reading the Farmers Weekly, as I do these days, um, and seeing some of the comments from their readers on their blog, um, and also seeing the blogs of the, the hunting and fishing and shooting community, as I do these days, I tend to slip easily into despair. And it's difficult not to do that. It's, 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 it's very necessary to keep some optimism in this kind of business, and sometimes it's hard, because uh, it's apparent that there are still hordes of people out there in 2010 who absolutely think it is cool to use and abuse animals in any way they choose. I see them justifying it in terms of money, or they would say we have to feed our families, in terms of feeding the country, although many of us don't want to eat animal products anymore, and many of them justify it in the kind of gloating thing like I'm a real man, I like to kill things. And there's a lot of that about, a lot more than I realized when I started this. And I find it quite sickening, really. Um, I don't think it's limited to any particular class of person. You know, you get the, the yobos who go out and say, oh, I like to kill things, you know, I like to see dogs fight each other, I like the blood and all that kind of stuff. And you get the chaps who say, well, I like to kill things, I like, I, I love deer, I love them on the plate because they taste nice. And of course, if we didn't kill them, they'd be overrunning the place. You know, so this, so this kind of mindset is, is still permeating our society. And, well, yeah, it's depressing. But I know all of you are here because you care. 
Um, I think there is a wind of change out there. I think things are changing. And um, it's kind of a watershed uh, in the sense that everything comes to a crisis at some point. You know, things seem to, to be very bad at the moment. We don't have any help from the very top of this country at the moment. Um, but if we can succeed and keep our hands in there at this point, I think there will come a point when um, things visibly start to change. So I think it's very important that we stay strong and optimistic at this point. Okay, I'd like to start the wild animal thing by imagining that I am in a hostile place. And my title is Man as a Wild Animal. So the first shout that I would hear would be, well, who the hell does Brian May think he is? Talking about wild animals, you know, what does he know about wild animals? He comes from the town, he's a rock star, he's never had a plowshare in his hand, all this kind of stuff. And I've constantly had that kind of leveled at me. And, so, and they would say, well, what the hell does he mean, man? It's not a wild animal. Obviously, we're not wild. We're the civilized species, right? And all the other creatures on Earth are wild, right? Well, this is exactly what you'll get from people who daily treat animals as commodities as a way of making money, making food, <coughs> acquiring scientific and medical statistics, and or just providing entertainment for those who want to shoot them, and torture them, and bait them, or hunt them with packs of brutalized dogs. Think about that. This rather inhuman mindset says, it's only a cat, it's only a dog, it's only a monkey, it's only a fox, they don't have feelings like us. To imbue them with feelings is anthropomorphism. It's a fallacy. Well, I'll return to this thought later, perhaps. But they'll say this. They'll say, we are human. We are special. We have a God-given right to use the animals around us for our own benefit. And we've invented an adjective which describes the way we think we are. We think we are humane. And no animal can be humane like us because we have consciousness. Well, whether, you, whether or not you believe that, uh, <laughs> that the Earth and all its creatures were created in seven days, or if you believe in the, the amazing Darwinian evolutionary theory of creation, I think most people would agree that only 100,000 years ago or so, the Earth was populated by an amazing diversity of creatures, all living in balance, and among them was a species of animal called man. And um, I have to say, I've sometimes been tempted to blame Christianity for what happened, but obviously Christianity isn't uniquely to blame. Um, I actually looked into it because I, I have a friend who's a, uh, a Roman Catholic priest, and I said, well, I was taught, when I was at Sunday school, they said um, in the Old Testament, and God gave man dominion over all the animals. And I said, well, you guys are to blame for the fact that we think we're so special. And he said to me, he said, I'm reliably informed that the, uh, the text from which this was translated, which I think is Aramaic, actually can be much better interpreted as saying, and God entrusted man with the care of all the creatures on earth. Now, if this is so, man's made a bloody terrible job of it. Um, I was at a meeting, um, Claire and I were at a meeting recently of the BUAB, the anti Section Society, I'm sure you know them, um, hosted by the wonderful Caroline Lucas, Green Party MP for Brighton. And the world famous zoologist Ian Redmond, OBE, was speaking. And he spoke of changing attitudes in the scientific world. He noted that only a generation ago, any biologist attributing maternal feelings leading to maternal behavior in a monkey would be drummed out of the scientific community. He would be accused of being anthropomorphic and never taken seriously as a scientist again. He said, this is no longer the case. Recent mapping of genomes has revealed the uncanny <coughs> similarity of human makeup to that of primates, and only a little less closely to many of the other ma mammals, such as mice and rats. And it's now pretty much accepted in the scientific world that the idea that over here humans think and behave rationally, but animals over here act on instinct, is really not supportable anymore. In fact, modern science tends to start from the point of view that man is an animal, and it's much more informative to study animal behavior in humans rather than to look for human behavior in other creatures. So this looks good. Um, but the truth is that 
all the success man has had in colonizing the planet Earth, uh, he's still very little changed from the truly wild Homo erectus as he emerged about, I think, 100,000 years ago. Now, can I support this view? Are we very different from those cavemen? Well, I would say the veneer of logic and reason and civilization in humans is amazingly thin. This is kind of anecdotal. I'm not being a scientist at the moment, but let, just bear with me for a second. If you've ever been in a, a situation of potential disaster, you'll know what I'm talking about. I remember being on a tropical island some years ago, and suddenly there was a hurricane warning, and there was a hurricane Andrew actually he heading straight towards the island. And the prediction was that the island would be completely destroyed and lives may be lost. Well, a bunch of holidaymakers, all being nice to each other, suddenly turned into something very different. Everybody's pushing and shoving and jockeying position, and everybody was prepared to push everybody else out of the way um, to try and get on the few planes that were supposedly going to get us off this island. And it turned very ugly, very quickly. Um, you know, who would get on the plane? Who would be saved from destruction? And suddenly it really seemed like life and death and the survival of the strongest. Uh, eventually, most of the holiday makers did get off. And I'll never forget the moment when we sat on the plane, just about to take off, and the, he the air hostess came around and said, would you like tea or coffee, sir? <laughs> and suddenly, the, the most important decision you have to make is whether you have tea or coffee, rather than life or death for your kids. Um, I think there are many places where you don't have to look very far to see what we might call animal behavior in us, or what might be called instinctive behavior, if we want to call it that. What are the most important things we all think about? Well, survival is one. And if we're walking home and somebody looks threatening or lurches up to us in a threatening way, we don't spend a lot of time analyzing the situation. We act pretty instinctively. The, the fight or flight reaction starts in our bodies. We feel adrenaline pumping, and we either <coughs> attack this person or we run. It's the fight or flight thing. That's a very instinctive reaction and very important to us. But it applies in a generalized way to the way we behave in the world. There's so much irrational fighting and, and running <laughs> going on in the world, um, quite apart from what logic would tell us. Um, we know this from the fact that we still fight wars over things we shouldn't be fighting about. Um, what else do we think about? Well, the male part of the human race is supposed to think about sex every five minutes. I thought you'd laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously not. You know. um, I don't think it's much of an exaggeration, really. That's the way we're programmed. And this tells us that even if we think we're completely engaged in these life tasks that we're doing, actually our mind is zipping over there the whole time. We're thinking about who are we going to procreate with? Um, and in a sense, we should see that as a victory for the selfish gene, the genes that are inside us, um, who are pushing us to survive so that they can survive. You've, you've probably come across the selfish gene. Um, that might, this might seem slightly sort of trivial as an observation, you know, that we think about sex all the time. But why did we get married? All of us here, do we go somewhere and analyze lots of statistics and analyze people's personalities and see who would be the most suitable mate to procreate with? No, I don't think any of us did that. We just fell in love. And it was an incredibly instinctual thing. We suddenly thought, this is the person I want to have babies with. This is the person I want to spend the rest of my life with. And there was no analysis involved. And this is exactly the way animals behave, of course. They mate instinctively. And that is what has got us to the place we are as a strong species which has survived. Um, there are many other ways in which we behave like mammals, and they're all very important. Uh, and it seems like the stuff, you know, the business of making money and, um, and buying houses and stuff is actually not that important compared to this stuff. And it's, it's very strange that the, it's, it's recognized in our society because we don't get taught in schools how to get married. We don't get taught how to, to raise children, which, my God, should be the most important thing we're ever taught. I, didn't, I never got taught how to raise children. Um, so we recognize that there's a fantastic amount of instinctual behavior in these things. 